facilities that make this program possible are provided by the City of Highland Park. Programs are produced independently by members of the community. The City of Highland Park is not affiliated with the following program or the producers of public access programming and is not responsible for the content. The following program does not reflect the opinions of the City of Highland Park. And welcome to Commons Current Events Roundtable. Today we have a wonderful guest who I've been trying to get on the show for how many years, Barry? Several. <laughs> and I always see Barry. He's always at the Highland Park. I've, I've seen him so many times. You, you've done lectures for Highland Park Senior Center. You've been around for... Uh, uh, everywhere that I go, I, I see Barry Bradford, and you're one of the few guests that my husband loves watching <laughs> and seeing and being there. And I want to welcome you to Commons Current Events Roundtable. Thank you. Thank Finally, you. let <laughs> me you. get you. It's a pleasure to be here. I speak all over the country, <laughs> and the opportunity to talk to people in my own backyard is really wonderful. <laughs> Thank you, Barry. Yeah, sometimes, you know, the shoemaker's shoes, you know, the story. But I know Barry's a historian, and he's lectured all over the world. He's been, he's been uh, on every, practically every television station there is. Uh, you, I remember you even opened the Mississippi burning case and brought a murder to justice. I mean, Barry, you've been you've been around, and I know you won the uh, the Golden Apple Award for Excellence in Teaching, and that is really something. I wish I had a teacher like you when I was going to school because we they did not exist then. And um, I just want to we're going to be talking about. Uh, the overview of the 2016 presidential election, and we're also going to be talking about the vice presidents, possible vice presidents on both parties. Uh, that's something you don't hear about. And um, I also want to read something that I thought was interesting, and that kind of will open up our discussion on uh, what the strategies of each party is as we go into the election. And that's something that um, Steve Huntley of the Chicago Sun-Times wrote. He says, GOP needs a liberal public relations firm. Too many times GOP policies to, seem to be formulated without serious regard for how it will sound to anyone outside the party base, you know, such as they they did the letter to Iran, which was fine. There was nothing wrong with it, but they kind of bypassed the president. And I think if they had a good public relations firm, maybe they could have included him and yet got their point across. Well, it's not just that particular author's conclusion. It's the Republican Party's own conclusion. Uh, after taking drubbings in two straight presidential elections, Rance Priebus, the head of the Republican National Committee, ordered a very in-depth and very substantial review of what the state of the Republican Party is. And among the more interesting conclusions they came up to with is that the Republican Party does a great job of speaking to people who already agree with them. And their own conclusion was that they don't do a good job of converting people or bringing them into their way of thinking. So if you consider, when people talk about what is the mainstream media, the number one news network on cable is Fox News. But people don't watch Fox News because they're undecided. They watch Fox News because they want to hear what they agree with. The same reason people watch MSNBC. The Republican so Party the recognizes that yeah. this is an issue for themselves. Well, Fox is always considered Republican. Uh, the MBC, MBC, uh, C, MSNBC, and MSNBC, yes, with a mouthful, uh, is the left-wing liberal. Mm -hmm. Now, CNN, the middle, is kind of in the middle of both of them. 
Um, there's uh, some some other news broadcasts too that are that are out there. What America? There's so many new ones that are popping all uh, over, and it's just like you don't know who to believe. And then there's those polls. You know, they tell you this is going to this is the person that's going to be, and then you find out that that person's not the worst, the best, the best person, and the poll that changes. I don't know. Who do you believe, Barry? Well, you know, it's intriguing that within our lifetime, public opinion polls showed that the most trusted person in America was Walter Cronkite at one time, the anchorman of the CBS Evening News. Where today could there be an anchorman or a news person that everyone would agree on? If he was in the middle of the road, he'd be attacked from both sides. If she was to the right, Liberals would attack her if he was to the mm -hmm. right, uh, to the left, then conservatives would attack her. We've lost a common sense of purpose, and our politics have become so fragmented as a result that the two feed off of each other. People watch the news to be reinforced with what conclusion they already hold rather than to objectively decide what position they should espouse. Mm. Uh, well, the strategies of these parties, what are the strengths of each party as we go into the election? Maybe we need to find out, maybe our viewers need to know what you consider the strengths, sure. weaknesses. I think that's kind of important. Well, remembering that I'm speaking as a historian, not as a partisan, what we can do is look at historical data and say, here we are now a year and a half out from from the next presidential election, how do each of the parties stack up? And we can say the Republican Party has two significant advantages. The first is they have a really deep and very well-balanced potential candidates out there. But there's for, so many. Well, would I count 100,000? Well, <laughs> no. four I mean, years it's ago. It's going to be like a four you know, graduation ago in the, class. But four years ago in the Republican primaries, we had people that were not considered heavyweight candidates. You had people like Herman Cain and Newt Gingrich and Michelle Bachman, and around the periphery were people mm -hmm. like Donald Trump and Sarah Palin. This time around, yeah. the Republicans are looking at a deep bench of governors with serious accomplishments. Uh, Jeb Bush from Florida, Chris Christie from New Jersey, Scott Walker mm -hmm. from Wisconsin, John Kasich uh, from uh, Ohio, Rick Perry, from Texas. And then they have a number of people in the U.S. Senate who now have some years under their belt and have made a dynamic approach. And, and I think when you said years under the belt, I think this is one of the problems that I see that President Obama has had. It, and the reason a lot of the Republicans and some of maybe some of the old, uh, the old Democrats that have been around uh, have had problems because he was a first year senator that became president instead of, you know, they like to see uh, your your president go through maybe if he was a governor or go through the Senate first year, second year, third year, fourth year. They like seniority, and because he had no seniority, they I think the only person before that was uh, that I can remember that was president was John F. Kennedy. He was a freshman senator, but everybody you know, so he didn't play the good old boys uh, type of thing the club type of thing, which I think that's the problem that he's had. Well, but, it, but again, from a historical standpoint, at least in modern American history, the public tends to vote for people who are not entrenched parts of the government. Ronald Reagan ran that I'm an outsider from Washington. George W. Bush ran I'm an outsider from Washington. Well, George W. Bush Bill was Clinton his, ran his I'm an was, outsider yeah, from Washington. But his father was president, so his name, the recognition mm -hmm. of his name. There was a time historically... And he was when, governor, though. He was but governor. There, historically, there was a time when voters preferred people with long lists of experience. Today, that's not true. Mm -hmm. The Republican senators who are interested in running, who are... At the forefront are people like Ted Cruz and Marco Rubio um, who and Rand Paul, none of whom have been senators all that long. And the reason is the longer you're in the Senate, the more votes you have to make and the easier it is to pick apart votes you've had. Same thing with governors. The longer somebody is a governor, the easier it is to have a record and say, well, but unemployment went up while you were governor or businesses closed while you were governor. So you're saying they don't have as much baggage. That's right. And voters, voters are looking for the next big thing. Interestingly, two of the Republicans who have talked about getting into the race, 
come from non-political backgrounds. Carly Fiorina in California, who was a CEO of a major company, and Dr. Ben Carson, who had been a neurosurgeon at Johns Hopkins, are, e are e even opening up the dialogue more, saying maybe our next president doesn't need to come from a political background. That's up for voters to decide, but certainly there's been a momentum in the last 40 years to take people who are outsiders from Washington. Well, President Obama didn't come from really a political background. He was a senator, but he before that he was a constitutional attorney. Uh, he was an attorney, and he taught constitutional law. So he was more of a professor than uh, I, I only. You know, he only was a senator what for less than a year. Well, and not that I would compare their accomplishments or personalities directly, but on a historical basis, Abraham Lincoln had served two years in the Congress and had spent most of his time as a lawyer and a state legislator in Illinois, which would be equivalent to Barack Obama. And again, I'm not saying that Barack Obama is Abraham Lincoln, but I'm saying that historically, yeah, there are precedents for presidents coming in without a great deal of political experience. Sometimes in the case of uh, President Eisenhower coming from a military background. In other cases, look at Jimmy Carter. He had been a one-term governor of a mid-sized state and said, I ran an agribusiness company, but I'm not from Washington. You can trust me. Ronald Reagan had been governor of the biggest state in the country, and he said, government is the problem. You know what I want to ask you, which yeah. we, I, we, I just all of a sudden thought about. Ted Cruz, he is born in Canada, and his, I guess his uh, parents were his, American. But then they were saying about Barack Obama that his father was born in Africa and, uh, you know, but his mother was born in the United States. So isn't that the same relationship? I don't get it. It is. The Donald Trump argument that Barack Obama was not eligible to be president because, according to Donald Trump, Barack Obama was born outside of the continental United States so, so is, is that, nonsense. So was Ted Cruz. And Donald Trump has agreed that Ted Cruz is probably, in Donald Trump's worldview, not eligible to be president. Now, the difficulty comes in that the Constitution says in order to be a president, there are certain specifications, age limits, and residency requirements, but it says you must be a natural-born citizen, and the Constitution didn't spell out exactly what that meant. However, we have had several people who have run for president and been taken seriously for president who were not born in the continental United States. John McCain was born not even in the Panama Canal Zone, which would have been an American territory, but in the, in the nation of Panama. Congress agreed with a sense of Congress resolution that John McCain was eligible because his parents were American citizens. When Barry Goldwater ran, at the time of his birth, he was born in a territory, the territory of Arizona. It wasn't even a state mm. yet. And there was never a question that he was eligible. But going back to the question of the structural advantages, the Republicans have a very deep bench of candidates, which they didn't have a few years ago. And secondly, from a historical perspective, it's an interesting that it is fairly unusual in American history for a president to be elected and serve two full terms, eight years as president, and be succeeded by a member of his own party. In the lifetime of most of the people watching today, that would be President Ronald Reagan and President Franklin Roosevelt and nobody else. Popular Republican presidents like Eisenhower were succeeded by Democrats and a popular Democratic president, Bill Clinton, was succeeded by a Republican. So that historical impetus mm -hmm. helps the Republicans. Now from the Democratic side, they have a couple of very strong advantages. The first is they have Hillary Clinton, who is the most popular candidate so far on the horizon. Right, if she doesn't hurt herself by, well, she recently that's destroyed a, her <laughs> emails, which, that, which, which, which we, we talked earlier, why would she do that? Especially, I would leave all my emails, even if I was talking to my daughter about, should I get a pink flower or a blue flower? I mean, I would, I would leave everything there, no matter how important or how non-important or how irrelevant something is, just so nobody questions anything. I don't know why she would do that, especially when she knew knew that they were going to, you know, that they were going to uh, get the, the one of the tapes. They were going to, get, uh, what's the word? Um, uh, subpoena. Subpoena. That's what the word I well, was looking for. Subpoena the tapes. As a historian, it's not my job to defend Hillary Clinton, and people can judge her actions regarding her uh, emails as they wish. It's been pointed out 
that it is not unusual for politicians, including Scott Walker, to have their own email servers that they consider their property. I believe that Hillary Clinton has admitted that she probably shouldn't have done that. The question is, but she knows in a, because in a she nation, knows, she, but she, they've been after her, so she knows that. So that's the question is, in a nation under attack by terrorism, in a difficult recovery from the second worst depression in American history, is that really the issue that most Americans are going to vote on? Are they going to say, you know, I'm not concerned with what Ted Cruz's position on immigration is, and I'm not concerned with what Hillary Clinton's position on ISIS is, I'm concerned about Hillary Clinton's private email server. I, I just don't think that yeah. historically it's going to come out. Now, the other big advantage that Democrats have, because I want to finish that thought, is that the electoral college is right now very stacked in the Democrats' favor. It's said by many historians, demographics is destiny. Right now, the Democrats have certain states that they are going to win in every realistic scenario for a presidential election. The Republicans have certain states. The Democrats are not going to carry Mississippi in the next election, no matter who their candidate is. And the Republicans are not going to cal carry California in the next election, no matter who their candidate is. If you look at how the numbers break down, it turns out that the Democrats have about two-thirds of all the votes they need in the Electoral College. So it all boils down to the Electoral College, you're It saying. does. And right now, there and is vote. no yeah. Democratic state that is leaning Republican, but there are several Republican states which, not in next year's election, but as we look at demographics in six to ten years, will begin to tilt uh, Democratic. One will be Georgia and the other will be Arizona. The reason is when you get a lot of high-tech firms and high-tech workers moving into an area, they vote Democratic. Hispanic voters tend to vote Democratic. What groups are growing in Georgia and in Arizona? Those are the groups. But it depends on who's running. Now, if Jeb Bush, for instance, runs, his wife is Hispanic, that may encourage people, Hispanics that do vote Democrat, may uh, switch to being a Republican because he would understand the, you know, the situation much more so. That, and he speaks uh, Spanish fluently. And, you know, being that his wife is, you know, Hispanic, they would understand other things that are going on, the needs of the Hispanic voter. So it depends. I see who may be running, too. I think that you're overestimating the power of a candidate's wife to influence the voters. <laughs> I don't um, know. George I W. Bush. wife's influence a lot of things. Now, I, George I W. Bush uh, spoke spoke passable Spanish, came from a border state with a lot of uh, both legal and illegal immigrants from Central and South America there, and it didn't particularly help him with Hispanic voters. He didn't do significantly better than Mitt Romney did. And the reason is that Hispanic voters, like many Americans of, of all racial backgrounds, are really interested in the question of, well, what do you do about immigration? When Jeb Bush was governor of Florida, Elian Gonzalez was ordered to be returned to Cuba. Do you remember the images of oh, I remember armed that. soldiers having yeah. to come in to enforce right. an order? But now, then if there's like Marco Rubio comes in, I think he's Cuban. Is, am I correct? Marco Rubio is, he Cub he's is Cuban? Cuban, and Ted yeah, Cruz's is family is partly Mexican. Now, a candidate like that could absolutely have an impact, but the question will still be, what do you do about immigration? In the last presidential election, when Mitt Romney was in the Republican debates and was asked about immigration, his solution, which becomes the centerpiece of his campaign for president, is we will encourage the self-deportation of Ill oh, illegal immigrants. Well, that, was, that wasn't a very <laughs> smart move. Well, I mean, he's a very smart man, but he didn't... He, he, he did, people didn't under, He didn't really... When you speak to, I remember when I wrote my dissertation, and I got my PhD, and I wrote my dissertation, I had somebody uh, from the Nobel Prize on my committee, and he said to me, Suzanne, take your dissertation and throw it away. I want you to write as though a high school kid can pick up your dissertation and understand it. And I think this is what happened uh, with Mitt Romney. He spoke over everybody's head. He didn't, he wasn't, he couldn't for some reason bring himself down to the level of the, of the, of the voter. I, I would disagree with that interpretation of Mitt Romney. I think the fact that he wasn't able to articulate any specific immigration policy was indicative not of 
an inability to communicate, but rather an inability to form a consensus building program. Let's take your thought for a moment. I think Marco Rubio would actually be one of the strongest candidates the Republicans could mm -hmm. run. He's very, very impressive man. His, he's a terrific communicator. He comes across very well on television. He's an energetic campaigner, and he comes from an important swing state. So let's say that Marco Rubio runs for president. I imagine that many Hispanic voters across this country would feel a great sense of pride, but then the question would be, what do you do about immigration? The fact that you are Hispanic doesn't mean that you have a solution to the problem. Consider that according to some estimates, there are 13 million people in this country illegally. What would be the solution for removing them if that was the choice? Well, what the Republican Party talks about is they say, we need increased border security. Well, I think everybody would agree mm -hmm. that that's a good and right. noble idea. And they say, we should not encourage illegal immigration. Ag again, I, I can't imagine arguing against that. Now, what do you do about the 13 million people who live in the United States, many of whom pay taxes, and I mean, some of whom have children who are American citizens by virtue of being born here? Right, you can't deport them. Well, if you right. added together every active duty member of the American military and everybody who wears a uniform as a police officer of any kind in America, there are more illegal immigrants than there are law enforcement people, and we saw how many people it took to deport Elian Gonzalez. So both parties are going to be challenged to come up with an immigration policy and a policy for dealing with the folks who are in the country right now that makes sense. The difficulty is that there isn't a national consensus on that, and one of the things that more and more candidates, particularly on the Republican side, have done is to simply talk in generalities about it without specifying, well, what do we actually do with the folks who are here? So both sides have strengths and weaknesses. One of the weaknesses the Democrats have going into the next election is if the candidate isn't Hillary Clinton, now it doesn't become quite as clear. Who the do they go to Governor Mar Andrew Cuomo from New York? Do they go with somebody like Jim Webb, who had been a cabinet official under Ronald Reagan and was a governor and senator? Or, and Elizabeth, a Vietnam or Elizabeth Warren. Or Elizabeth Warren, yeah. Yeah, she has uh, also, but she doesn't have very much experience, especially with uh, international politics. You know, she's just, uh, you know. Yeah, it's, it's probably... It's Hillary, probably unrealistic. Hillary Clinton does. But then you have to talk about, you know, one thing that nobody talks about, and to me it's so important, is the vice presidents. Because, and we have a very little time left, Barry, and I'm going to invite you back on the show because we have I'll hours. Come back we have hours <laughs> that we have to put into a half hour show. But, you know, we, you know, something happens to our president or they get sick or disabled or something happens to them. A vice president candidate is needed needs to be, have a, his, his strength and it has to have all these things you're talking about. I think the wake up call on that was the election of 2008 when John McCain went off the board and chose Sarah Palin. Sarah Palin is a woman who had been the mayor of a town about the size of Deerfield for a couple of years. Mm -hmm and then a governor of a state whose population is approximately that of a right. large county in Illinois yeah. for a couple of years. See, if he went with Elizabeth Dole or Kate, Kate Bailey, Bailey Hutchinson, yeah. these were established women. I agree. Women could have crossed over. People that were upset that Hillary Clinton didn't get elected, they could identify with a woman like that, but they couldn't, as you said, yeah. identify with Sarah Palin. Well, more than that, in her interviews um, with news people, and in her public pronouncements, she came off as uninformed about the issues she right. would have to step in. And to the point where uh, John McCain's campaign director, Steve Schmidt, at one point was asked, is Sarah Palin ready to be president? He said, well, probably not on day one, but she could grow into it. <laughs> I agree that yeah. she could have. Any, any intelligent person could do that. But I think that the reaction to seeing somebody who came off as fairly Naive. lightweight. Naive. Um, yeah for vice president convinced both parties not to do that again. Mitt Romney picked a superb vice presidential candidate with, with Paul Ryan, with Paul Ryan, who is a man of ideas. Now you can debate right. the ideas and you can argue with them. But he was a strong candidate. I would say as a historian that Paul Ryan is the kind of candidate historians love because he's a man of ideas with 
who speaks in specifics, who says, we have important problems with the funding of Medicare. What do we do about that? Yeah, if you agree or you don't agree, yeah. at least he had things... You, you know, know what he stands for, right, yeah. Exactly. And they need, and that's why they need, both parties need a Paul Ryan type person for bo both of them for vice president. Well, traditionally, selection for vice president has been a question of balance. You try and figure out what your presidential stra candidate strengths are and then find a vice president who complements that. Traditionally, historically, that meant find somebody from a different part of the country than the president. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's as crucial now. Now I think it's a matter of needing somebody, for instance, Barack Obama chose Joe Biden because Joe Biden had been so heavily involved in foreign affairs as a senator and knew Congress well, which were not President Obama's strengths. Paul Ryan had a depth of understanding of the way Congress works that Mitt and Romney... The and the economy. Yeah, that Mitt Romney didn't have as, the gov as a right. one-term governor right. of a state. I think that the Republican Party, if they nominate one of their white male candidates, of whom they have some really outstanding possibilities, would probably look at somebody like Governor Susanna Martinez of New Mexico. And she would have been Hispanic, of, uh, and she's a very strong candidate. Yeah, a very accomplished governor of a mm -hmm. blue state. The mm -hmm. Republicans need to win blue states. Hispanic. And she was just reelected in the last election, even though she was the only Republican to win election mm -hmm. in her state. Uh, somebody like that would be a great choice. If Hillary Clinton is the nominee of the Democratic Party, I tend to doubt that she would choose another woman on the ticket simply because of this question of balance. The interesting thing will be to see if Hillary picks somebody considerably younger than she is because one of the questions that will be raised about her is her age. I don't think anybody is older than her on the, you know, for vice president like yeah. Uh, Jim, Jim, uh, Jim Webb. Webb is older. Joe Biden Jim Webb is, is, older? Yeah, is older. I didn't realize he but was older. But what's interesting is, and I'm sure this, as a psychologist, this is something you're very aware of, that the pe people perceive women aging differently than they perceive men aging. You didn't hear anybody saying when Mitt Romney was floating a bubble about running again this year, oh, Mitt Romney is too old to be president. He's got grandchildren. Mm -hmm. Mitt Romney's a couple of months older than Hillary Clinton. Mm -hmm. they're with, well, they're within a couple of months of each other. They would be almost precisely the same age when they took over. But I think because Hillary Clinton is a woman, there is that question raised. Well, Barry, you know, we got two minutes left on this show. Maybe you could just give us a two-minute uh, prediction of what you think or who you think would be uh, the candidates. The problem the Republican Party has in choosing a candidate is in order to win the Republican nomination, you have to be very conservative, but in order to win a presidential election, you have to appeal to the middle. Mm 